For reasons that utterly escape everyone involved, you're listening to a bipolar, a schizophrenic, and a podcast. Here are your hosts, Gabe Howard and Michelle Hammer. You're listening to a bipolar, a schizophrenic, and a podcast. My name is Gabe Howard, and I'm bipolar. I'm Michelle Hammer, and I'm schizophrenic. And together we have a podcast. That's right. We do. It's such a good one. I love it so much. I think that it is the very best podcast for mentally ill people by mentally ill people. Me too. I agree with that completely wholeheartedly. I can't really think of another one, but I've noticed that since our podcast started to get popular, people started showing up and saying, well, I'm mentally ill and my podcast is for mentally ill people. And, but I I don't think that's true. I think that they do live with mental illness, but I think they just had a podcast and hoped to gain an audience. Whereas we were like, yes, we need to create content for our community. Our community is just underserved. It is. It's incredibly underserved. This is what I love about podcasting because it's like such a niche thing. You know, the mental health community and, and people who live with mental illness, we, we are small, which which is good because, you know, thank God, like everybody's not living with mental illness. That would be terrible. So, you know, we're never going to be like on NBC at eight o'clock. I mean, that that's where you get programming that appeals to like the mass markets and mass audience. So the nice thing about podcasts is we can have that little niche market. I mean, some some mentally ill people targeting a small group. And that's that's why we exist. But it is sad because really, we should be like super famous. Oh, yeah, totally. If we don't self-sabotage it. Exactly. And we have done this to ourselves with this very show on numerous occasions. Many. 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 Remember the time that you quit the show because you refused to talk to me for like an entire day? When did that happen? It, it happened, you know, like several months ago when we were at Olive Garden. You were just like, I'm not making eye contact. I hope you die. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. I remember that. It was, But it was incredibly awkward. And we were talking about ways to make the podcast better. And you got all, 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 what did you get, Michelle? Quiet. I believe butthurt is the term we're looking for. If you insist, because you were being a dick. How? How? You were how? being a dick. You were how just being? being a dick. You're like, really? yeah, yeah. This sucks, and that sucks, and you suck, and everything sucks. Really? Yeah. I said you suck. Pretty much. You really? basically said you suck. Ah, ah. And there is the key word when it comes to self-sabotaging behavior. It's when we believe things to be true because they're basically true. Like what you just said, Michelle, you basically said you suck. That is but not, did I that's actually, not self-sabotaging wait, behavior. Wait, wait, It's not self-sabotaging did I behavior. Did actually say you suck? Pretty much. No, not pretty much. Did the words Michelle Hammer sucks comes out of Gabe's mouth? Yes. Liar. Liar. Mm. Lie. Now you no, I'm going to quit on the air. Fine. I resign in protest. You've been listening to a schizophrenic and a podcast. Number one. Reason number one for self-sabotage is when you feel like you don't deserve to be successful. Have you ever felt like you don't deserve to be successful? Oh, you're just going to sit there, Gabe. You're just going to sit there and not even say anything. You fired me. The only reason I'm here is because we're in my house. Well, do you say that I self-sabotage this podcast? I don't think that you're self-sabotaging the podcast. I think you're self-sabotaging yourself. Because, as you pointed out in number one, I think you are afraid of success. You think so? Yes. Well, that's very interesting to point out because it seems like one of the biggest things about self-sabotage is the fear of trying one's best and not succeeding. Do you feel that you try your best? Yes. And when you try your best, do you feel that you always succeed? No. And are you okay with that? I mean, it's frustrating. Well, sure. Nobody said it can't be frustrating. I think a lot of people don't think that they're self-sabotaging because they think, oh, they're protecting themselves or they're giving it enough effort to work. But really, self-sabotage behavior is kind of twofold. It's one, not giving something 110% because you think, oh, what's the point? It's just going to fail anyways. And two, when you get close to that success, it's also doing things like showing up late or showing up unprepared or to use a sports analogy, going out late the night before and eating a bunch of pizza. I would agree with that. Have you ever done that? Like before a lacrosse game, like just gone out, like drinking the night before? No, we had rules. Well, but disobeying those rules would be a way of sabotaging yourself. It would be sabotaging your success. And then if you lose, you can say, oh, I'm still the best lacrosse player. The only reason I lost is because I was drunk. 
that would be really, really ridiculous. And my whole team would be really, really mad at me. I wouldn't do that. So you care when your team is mad at you when you're working on a project, like say a lacrosse game or a podcast. Mm hmm. Well, another one, but I was looking up about self-sabotage, which I noticed that I did do, was I looking up and said, once in a while, we self-sabotage simply to push buttons. We pick a fight and we incite drama to get a rush. I would pick so many fights with my coach. So many fights. It was ridiculous. She once said to me that she wished that I was bad at lacrosse so she could just cut me from the team. So you're saying that when you respect somebody and look up to them, you push their buttons so that a fight can ensue and you can not talk to them at Olive Garden. Apparently. that That's what I'm hearing. I don't know how you're hearing that. How did we get to Olive Garden again? I, you, you hurt my feelings. You hurt my feelings. You hurt my feelings. You hurt more. my feelings. My feelings were the most hurt. My feelings were more hurt. Why I, do you think I, I wasn't talking to you? Back to self-sabotage. It feels better to control your own failure than to let it blindside you. So are you used to rejection? I'm not. I'm not. Every time I get rejected, it hurts. Now, I have developed some coping skills. Let's talk about the difference between our reactions publicly and our reactions privately. And, and here's why I want to touch on this. I don't handle rejection well. When people reject me, it really hurts my feelings. And I get upset. I eat ice cream. I refuse to leave the house for a day. I get really, really sad. My feelings get hurt. All of those things are true every single time I've ever lost uh, an award, a contest, a contract. Anytime somebody went with a, a different speaker over me or a sponsor didn't re-up, whatever. I, I get hurt almost every single time. But I handle it privately. You, you, you know, all, all joking aside to everybody, Michelle is actually really good at this because I'll, I'll write Michelle and I'll be like, oh my God, our stats dropped. And Michelle's like, oh, well, we'll get them next week. And, but I don't post on Facebook. Oh, everybody hates us. Our stats dropped. And I, I think that's what's important to understand. I think that all of us are probably kind of prone to beat ourselves up privately. What I want to talk about are the people that do it publicly. We all know those people that every single time they fail or get rejected, they just smear it everywhere. It's all over social media. It's all they talk about when you get together. They call up people and yell at them. They pick fights with their boyfriends and girlfriends. It's just they can just never be happy because of a single rejection. And they do it publicly. And I personally think it makes them look stupid. I mean, <laughs> I cannot stand passive aggressive Facebook statuses. Like give me an example of one. One day somebody will care about me as much as I care about them. Oh, uh, that's a big one. Yeah. That's that obviously directed towards a person. Yeah, that is an excellent point. The other one is uh, if you don't see my value, you'll see me walk away. Or there's the classic don't make someone a priority when you are just a something afterthought. An afterthought or whatever it is. Yeah, that's true. I have seen all of these Facebook statuses on your Facebook wall, Michelle. I have never once posted a Facebook status like that. I completely agree. You have not. And I respect that about you. And that is the thing that is really, that is the professional part of our relationship as, as we do talk a lot about things that go on behind the scenes. But, you know, the, the Olive Garden thing happened literally months ago. <laughs> I, and, and we're talking about it now in jest and to be funny. And because it did happen and because the show relies on like real stories of our lives and, and problems that we have had. But I'd like to point out that the whole time that you refused to make eye contact or speak with me, you weren't like on Facebook, like if he doesn't realize that I'm half of this podcast, then he can suck it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Everybody would have been like, I wonder who that's geared at. Let's see. She has one podcast, <laughs> one co-host, might be Gabe. Might be. Who could she be talking about? This gingerhead man is- Did you just call me gingerhead man? <laughs> wow. There's a gingerhead man being mean to me right now, and I don't like him a lot. You know, it's mean to make fun of somebody's physical characteristics, big nose. <laughs> I would never do something like that, frizzy hair. <laughs> We're going to step away to hear from our sponsor, and hopefully when we come back, we'll get back on track. Mm -hmm. 
This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp.com. Secure, convenient, and affordable online counseling. All counselors are licensed, accredited professionals. Anything you share is confidential. Schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus chat and text with your therapist whenever you feel it's needed. A month of online therapy often costs less than a single traditional face-to-face session. Go to BetterHelp.com forward slash Psych Central and experience seven days of free therapy to see if online counseling is right for you. BetterHelp.com forward slash Psych Central. Back to self-sabotage. There's also perceived fraudulence. When you do something that raises your public profile, you kind of feel like you only have farther to fall. I have suffered with this in my life because um, one day I think I realized that I have this online persona. People think I'm a cool person, I guess. I don't really think I'm that cool, but maybe one day I kind of think, what if people think I'm not cool and then everybody realizes I'm a big loser and nobody likes me anymore? First off, I sincerely doubt that you think you're not cool. That's that's just that, that I'm I'm going to call bullshit on that. You think that you are a badass. In fairness, you are. You've accomplished quite a lot and you deserve the confidence that you have. But I think that what you're trying to explain is you're worried that even though you think you're a good person and a cool person and you are capable, you're worried that people will think that you're a fraud. And the reason that they will think you're a fraud is because eventually you're going to fail. Eventually, you're going to have a project that doesn't work. And you've had projects that haven't worked. Michelle, you pop up. And you pop up in New York City, which is very, very difficult. I, I want to give you full props. A lot of people think that you just sell this stuff online and the relative safety of your own home. But actually, you you go out on the streets of New York City and sell your wares very publicly, right? Mm-hmm. Every time you go, do you sell the same amount? Oh, no. So that means sometimes your sales are successful and profitable. And sometimes, even though you're selling the exact same stuff and you're the exact same person, sometimes you lose money and you spend the whole day like for negative dollars. That has happened. Yes, yes, Failure. Yes. But you don't, you but don't that's think how that I, way. I started, I started in a deficit, but now it's getting way better with the connections that I've made through other places where I can pop up now in better spots for less of a price. Because when you do pop up in New York City, unless you have a permit, you have to pay to be at a pop-up shop in a certain place. So if you don't make over the amount of money that you've paid to have your place, you then lose money. But then there's also sales and then there's revenue. Did you make more in your revenue that you've actually paid? Are you explaining business to our listeners? Like we just became a business podcast. So we're like Forbes for mentally ill people. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, Michelle, for explaining business economics to our listeners. I've done days where I've sold one shirt. I've done days where I've sold 30 shirts. So what's the most shirts you've ever sold? In one day? Mm -hmm. About 30. And what is the least number of shirts you've ever sold? Uh, One. So that that's a world of difference. So yes. So even in your manufacturing enterprise is wildly successful. I, I mean, it really is. You you are you are very successful as a, a designer and seller of clothes. Correct. Yes. But all days aren't equal. So I think that sometimes people don't look at the whole. And uh, you know, our show, for example. Every single time we have an episode that goes poorly, what do I do? You get upset. And who do I call? Me. And what do you say? Next time will be better. Yes. And you point out that our stats for the entire month are always great. That yeah, you've got to have an episode that's the worst one in a month. You've got to have an episode that's the best one. They're not all going to be uniform. That's impossible. That is that is mathematically impossible. Some shows are going to do better than others. You always say it in like that New York accent and usually mocking me, but that is the pep talk that you give me every single time. But I always tell you, no, 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 this is proof that people are losing interest and that it's no longer good. And I start to just devolve very quickly into, oh, it's going to be over soon. And every month you're right. It goes back up. It does. Do you always try to find a scapegoat of why it failed? I don't try to find a scapegoat of why it fails because I often, let me start that again. I do always try to find a scapegoat and I always think that it's me. And by extension of it being me, I think it's you. So I always think it's us because the show is just us. I, 
I, I don't know that that's a bad way to look at it, though. I mean, if I'm being completely honest with myself, I do take credit for the success of the show. We take credit for the success of the show. And I feel very strongly that if you're going to take credit for something, you need to take the negative. If you're going to pat yourself on the back when you're successful, you need to take the blame for failure. And I just, I really, really detest people that want all the credit when things go well, but they're nowhere to be found when things go poorly. I don't like people like that. I don't. I think that it's irresponsible. I will be standing at the finish line whether we win or whether we lose. And I just believe that. There's no I in team. Yeah, but there's a me and an at. What? And meet. Meet. Meta. Meta. There's a meta in team. What is that supposed to mean, Gabe? It's very meta. I don't like that word. You don't like meta? What is meta? Like meta. Like like a box of boxes is very meta. Or putting spectrums on a spectrum is very meta. I don't know what you're talking about right now. You're, you're just sabotaging this podcast. That's very true. Do you think that it is a form of self-sabotage anytime I ask you like a very personal question and instead of answering it, you deflect onto something else? I don't think that's sabotage. I just think that's uh, ignoring you. No, I'm, I'm being serious. Like, for example, right there, it's just, you were really snarky. It, it, I'm just ignoring you. Why? Really? That's, I, I'm being sincere. That, that That's what you want the audience to think? That if Gabe asks you a question that you don't like, you just flat out ignore him? Isn't that very passive aggressive? You don't, you don't say no thank you. You don't change the stuff. You, you know what I mean? You're just, I'm just ignoring you, dick. No. I mean, I'm, I'm like your what business partner. What questions are you asking me that I'm not answering? Do you love your mother? Of course. Wow, I wish we had video right now. <laughs> I actually know that you are very, very fond of your mother, but whenever I ask the question, you always get like, like I swear to God, like your face turns red and some horns pop up and you're like, yes, I do. <laughs> Do you love your mother? Damn Skippy. She brought me into this world. She makes me turkey. She makes those little Hershey Kiss cookies that I like. But not the apple cookies that I like. She made them one year. Nobody liked them but me, so she'll never make them again. That bitch. I know. And now she claims that she lost the recipe. In the world of Google, how do you lose a recipe? You know, she's lying to you. I think she is. 100%. She is sabotaging Thanksgiving. Don't say that Thanksgiving is way over. Oh. She is sabotaging your happiness. She is. I think that she is sabotaging my happiness. You know what you could do, Gabe? You could just make those apple cookies. That is actually an excellent example. Right now, I am upset that last Christmas, my mother did not make me the cookies. And I blamed her for not finding the recipe. And I blamed her for not using Google to find the recipe. But I am capable of finding the recipe for her and she'd probably make them. I'm capable of finding the recipe and making them myself. I'm capable of going to a bakery and just buying the damn things. But instead, I am sabotaging the relationship that I have with my mother by continuing to complain about something that is easily rectifiable because in my mind it's easier to be pissed off and angry and put upon than to just solve the damn problem indeed did you self-sabotage when you were younger yes and i think that everybody does when they're younger because we don't understand the consequences yet hard work is hard work and working hard to get nothing is just the the ultimate in in depressing it really is we'll go back to the sports analogy uh, you know how everybody says there's no second place, there's just first loser? Mm -hmm. I mean, look, being the second best at something in the entire world is a pretty good place to be. But I understand it. You worked so hard and so long and you gave it everything you had and it didn't matter. Somebody was better than you. My God, that is devastatingly awful. But I try to remember that if I didn't give it 100% and I come in second, that means if I would have, I would have come in first. So the whole reason I'm not standing on top of the pile is because I half-assed it. And I think that's worse. In my mind, self-sabotaging is worse. It's why I put in way too much effort into any everything. You know how many people make fun of us for how much effort we put into our little podcast? 
People make fun of us? They make fun of us constantly. Who? Remember when we started and somebody said, you will never find a sponsor? Ever. Who said that? Yeah, we're, we're not going to out people on the show, but well, I'm pretty sure Well, whoever said that, you know what they can do. <laughs> y- yeah, you know what they can do. Michelle, when you told your family that we were going to start a podcast, did they ever think that it would be a money-making enterprise? Oh, absolutely not. Yeah, yeah. And is it a money-making enterprise? I'm making millions. Oh, okay. Now, now you're just lying. <laughs> Yeah. Now, exaggeration and grandiosity is going to be next week's show. (laughs) (laughs) Michelle, tie this together in a bow. Why do people self-sabotage and how do we get them to stop? I think people are are just afraid of doing well because they're afraid to fail. If you're afraid of failing, then you're just going to mess everything up when you're doing well. In high school, I was undiagnosed schizophrenic. I also had ADD that I didn't know about. I was really bad at reading books because I had I just couldn't concentrate on any of the books. So instead of handing in an essay that was going to be awful, I just wouldn't hand in an essay because I didn't want the teacher to see how stupid I was. So that's just self-sabotage right there. I'd rather get a zero than let the teacher know that I couldn't write because I was dumb. You'd rather fail because you didn't try than fail because you're not good enough. Exactly. But you deprived yourself of the opportunity to get better and possibly succeed. Well, I realize this now, but I did not realize this then. But somebody did realize it for you, right? Your parents, the teacher. I mean, somebody corrected this. You are a woman who knows how to read and graduated from college and you are quite successful. So I refuse to believe that you went through your entire school career doing no homework, turning nothing in and getting all zeros. So somebody fixed this for you. I did the easy stuff. I mean, I could read the short books, but if you put a gigantic book in front of me and tell me to read it, I'm going to have a panic attack. What if I take a gigantic book and I cut it into like 400 little books? Then could you read it? No. I read a book and I constantly check how many pages I have left. How does that help? It doesn't. I I, I just get so overwhelmed when I'm reading books. Still? Yes. How'd you make it through college? I didn't have to. I was an art major, Gabe. That's fair. I forgot. The only thing lower than an art major. Is a gym teacher? No. Mm. Somebody who plays sports. Oh. You know, sports is not a major. Isn't it? It's not. Isn't it? It's re- You can't graduate with a sports degree. What about all those all those college football players? What and where do they, do they end up? In? To conclude, Gabe. Stop being afraid of success. Don't be afraid to fail. Strive for the stars because if you fall, at least you land on the treetops. Soccer coach used to tell me that over and over again. And that's why you switched to lacrosse? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to this week's episode of a Bipolar, a Schizophrenic, and a Podcast. My name is Gabe Howard, and with me, as always, is Michelle Hammer. Remember, you can head over to store.psychcentral.com and buy the official Bipolar, a Schizophrenic, and a Podcast shirt. I'm sorry. Remember, you can head over to store.psychcentral.com and buy the official Define Normal shirt, which supports the show. Send us your topic ideas to show at psychcentral.com. Remember... Leave a comment everywhere you see this. Comments really, really help us. Leave us a five-star review. Write a review. Pass this on to your friend. Don't let our show die. Otherwise, Michelle and I will just continue to fight at Olive Garden. We will see you all next week. Win! You've been listening to a bipolar, a schizophrenic, and a podcast. If you love this episode, don't keep it to yourself. Head over to iTunes or your preferred podcast app to subscribe, rate, and review. To work with Gabe, go to GabeHoward.com. To work with Michelle, go to Schizophrenic.nyc. For free mental health resources and online support groups, head over to PsychCentral.com. The show's official website is PsychCentral.com slash BSP. You can email us at show at PsychCentral.com. Thank you for listening and share widely.